Uh, my new topic, and I, and I won't uh, take my talk time. To talk well, hold on, Bob. We'll, let's see. Are you, you want to talk as you're getting set up? Because yeah, we're going to, we're going to. I was just going to say, um, I just got into uh, home solar, adding solar rays to your home system, which has nothing to do with ham radio. But I've been a negative proponent of that for so long that I need, now need to tell everybody that I was wrong and it's the best thing you can do. And uh, <laughs> so you know, I just learned something totally new. I mean, with all the government incentives and the money on the table and the 40% uh, solar panels have, uh, have gone down 40% just this year and they only cost 1% of what they did in 1970. And I'm, I was still going on what I knew in 1970. So it's, it's just an eye opener for me. So if anybody wants to talk about it afterwards, I want to learn. One of the reasons I've titled my talk as uh, Universal Amateur Radio um, Text Messaging is that um, it also, there's a web page uh, that uh, has all the, the basics here. And also there was an article in this September QST uh, entitled the same thing. And so it's a continuation of the, actually it's the continuation of what I've been on since 1980 and this is what APRS was supposed to be, and it's just that uh, we got so off the beaten path with all these uh, GPS trackers out there that people still think of APRS as only a, text, a uh, vehicle tracking system, and that was never what it was designed to be. APRS was always designed to be just like we use every other brand of amateur radio, and that was if you have something to say, transmit it. Everybody sees it, everybody hears it, just like on voice radio, and uh, while you're not talking, you're listening to what everybody else has to say. And in an APRS, that just means it's, you know, you're gathering it and it's showing up on your display. Had nothing to do with position reporting. In fact, the original name of APRS was Automatic Packet Reporting System, so that, again, we could share information just like the, the voice net going into work or whatever, or it's an uh, event or the Marine Corps Marathon or whatever. Everybody uh, could enter information as fast as they could get it, and everybody else uh, copied it. Um, in 1993, 94, when GPS has started getting a blow $1,000 a piece, we added that to APRS, and then everybody took off with the position reporting and left the text messaging behind. And uh, uh, the other inspiration for this talk was uh, Steve Bible at an ARL. In fact, it was at that Dayton, uh, or at that same Dayton that I have the picture there. Uh, it was one of these ARL meetings about what are we going to do to save amateur radio? We've got to get youth involved. And um, instead of all of us old FUDs uh, playing with our radios, I mean, look at kids. You know, they, they text message from their, uh, their cell phones. And it's just, it's just like a second, second language. In fact, it's their first language, if you ask their parents. Um, that they just love text messaging. And we don't have anything like that in amateur radio. And I stood up from the floor and said, what are you talking about? We've had text messaging in APRS for 10 years now in, built into a commercial HT. You know, it was the Kenwood D7. You can text message anywhere in the world just by knowing a call sign, and you can send email to anybody in the world just by uh, their call sign from a ham radio that we've had 10 years now, uh, so long that it's now uh, out of production. And, um, and here we're just now waking up to, why don't we have text messaging in amateur radio? Uh, so I'm going to cover these among any other topic that uh, uh, occurs to me. Universal ham radio text messaging, uh, Appalachian Trail a Golden Packet event. You've probably heard me talk about that. And the, the drum I've been beating since 2000, and that is uh, APRS uh, touch tone, or text messaging with a DTMF radio. Okay, here's what um, the current, it, it currently looks like. I've counted 26 separate systems in amateur radio that can do text messaging or chatting. And so again, think of the original APRS, the original tent was just a chat channel where you could exchange information above everybody. The only problem is none of them are connected to each other. And I find that to be just a crime. Um, well, actually they are, because if, you, if this is the laser, all of these, of course, are all uh, APRS, so they're all talking to each other. And you can add APRS to any radio by just taking the uh, display head off a of D710 and attaching it to any old HT. Uh, there's a ham HUD device. Um, there's the uh, uh, GPSs now that can do uh, text messaging uh, through uh, APRS and, and others uh, considering that. AvMap is uh, considering uh, adding that. 
Um, and of course, any APRS system, you can send a text message straight from your microphone keypad to any other uh, internet-enabled device in the world, as long as it recognizes standard mail. Uh, so you can send email from uh, any, you know, been able to do this, guys, since uh, 1997 or 8, somewhere in their time frame. And so we have the send side of universal uh, text messaging from APRS, but here's, here's, here's an example. These uh, radios, Kenwood made one, and uh, I guess it was Yezu, there's 300,000 uh, DTMF text paging uh, radios in amateur radio. They've been out there since 1995, and I've never heard of one uh, used by anybody. Uh, it was a capability that was put in there, but again, we didn't take advantage of it. And, um, and uh, of course, any HT with a touchstone keypad can send a text message just like any kid can send on his cell phone. It's just who's listening, all right? Well, anybody can download software off the web for free that is a DTMF decoder. Take that to your next special event, set that up, put it on a channel, and say anybody out there that needs to send a message, text message to uh, headquarters, just pound it on DTMF, and it shows up right there on the, on the screen. You know, we got it today. We've, we've had it for years. You can just, you can just do it. We've got to get people to think outside the box. Um, we, uh, billions of text pagers are going into the dump because they're all being replaced by cell phones and everything else. And, you know, those are RF devices. They have text messaging displays and everything else. Uh, I don't see why a ham radio operator doesn't have one for five bucks. And, you know, we, we take our email and push it out on these text pagers. Um, Every laptop, BlackBerry, cell phone that's internet enabled, of course, can do text messaging. Uh, but can they uh, send messages to APRS? Yes, now they can. And uh, in fact, one of my favorite demos, which doesn't work here because apparently APRS, we can't even receive inside this building. There must not be an APRS uh, digipeter in this, in this uh, Elk Grove area. But, uh, you know, I point at somebody with a D7HT, and I got a guy over here with a BlackBerry, and I say, do you have a, you know, a call sign like AR? your call sign at ARL.org, and the guy says yes. I said, I tell the D7 guy, send him a message, and he gets the message. I mean, we can do that today. We've been able to do that. Uh, we're, people just aren't using it. So, um, for example, the, the one laptop per child is a super, uh, remember this is designed to work in mud huts in the middle of Africa or whatever, so it has a really tremendous uh, uh, Wi-Fi capability. So whenever you're anywhere near a Wi-Fi hotspot, this thing uh, you know, locks in real quickly because it has the fold-up antennas and dual diversity receivers and everything, so it's a really great uh, thing for a 100 buck laptop. And so um, um, Jack wrote a, a little interface for that, a little window, and so, uh, so whenever you're within Wi-Fi range, this window is there, and you've got universal text messaging. You can send a message to any APRS operator, email, anything you want. And, and of course, it does take your, you enter your, the um, um, zip code where you are, and uh, then everybody in the world will see you on the map, you know, just within that zip code. But, you know, there's still a position, positioning ramification to APRS. And well, where on the planet are you? Uh, you know, I'm talking to you by uh, text messaging. I want to know, you know, where you are. Okay, now I'm going to uh, divert, uh, uh, divert for a second to the Appalachian uh, Golden Packet. Um, this is just to show you a typical application of text messaging. And um, let me give you a little background. For 30 years, I've been showing up at uh, Hamfet. Well, is it 30 years? I don't know. I can't. 20 to 25 years. I've been showing up at Field Day every year with my trusty packet and APRS set up. And I'm treated kind of like, um, what are you doing here? And don't get no respect, um, because packet is just a sideshow. You know, they, for a while they gave us 100 points, and then they keep nibbling away at what you can't do and can't do and can't do, so that you can't get any points by APRS and everything else. And so uh, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated about that, because the whole reason I'm into APRS and packet radio is to get out in the field and play radio and do emergency comms and all that stuff, and, uh, and not be a bunch of Internet junkies or people driving around who are two-way amateur radio operators. You see them on the map, and you can't talk to them because they're... All they're doing is transmitting their position. And, and so that was nothing that uh, APRS was uh, invented for. So I said, um, let's just try this, uh, this summer to see if we can uh, do a live packet message from one end of the Appalachian Trail to the other. And uh, we'll go on all the mountaintops, and uh, we'll, we'll make an event. And then we got so excited about it, we said, let's make this an annual event. Um, let the HF people play field day. 
and anybody wants to play packet radio or D-Star or anything else they want to lug up to the top of the mountaintops, come on, let's have fun. And so we did it on the Appalachian Trail this year, and uh, it took us four, it takes 14 hops to get from Georgia to Maine. And of course, those guys out west, I think, could, could probably go from uh, Mexico to Canada in 10 hops um, if, they, if we could get them out of the shacks. Um, now, the other, the fantastic tool that's out there is Google Earth. I don't know, everybody played with Google Earth. I mean, you know, it's just, just fantastic. But, you know, you can, you can do ray tracing. And so here is the, uh, the path through from Georgia up into the central Virginia. Then there's a fantastic DX location that all the VHFers in the middle Atlantic states know in, uh, right up here in the middle of Virginia on the, Appala on the uh, uh, Blue Ridge uh, Parkway because you can just drive up there from uh, Roanoke, Virginia, so everybody knows where that is. So we said, okay, we've got to get from there to here, and what's the path through the uh, uh, Smoky Mountains? And, it, you know, 6,000-foot mountains should be a piece of cake. No, because what's surrounding 6,000-foot mountains? 5,000-foot mountains, okay? <laughs> and so it turns out, uh, but it was real easy, just sitting there in my shack. I basically did the whole event. You know, you go around and you just, you just zoom in all the way down. You can count the rocks and the parking places on top of every mountain, you know, on the East Coast. You zoom in and you, you pick all the ones you want to look at, and you look at each one of them, you start laying the traces out, and then you see what, uh, what works and what doesn't. And um, now, once we got uh, in, uh, into central um, uh, Virginia, then getting all the way to Maine was pretty well a straight shot. There's plenty of mountains along the way, except for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is full of mountains, but they're really hills. They're uh, 11 to 1,500 feet high, a million of them. And, of course, that's no better than being on flat land in Texas, you know, because... Anyway, so that was a little bit of a challenge, was getting through Pennsylvania. But, um, but here's, here's what you get with Google Earth. You just go, uh, zoom in, uh, point a point here, put a point there, and draw a line between them, and say, extend that line down to Earth, set the, the height of that line, and then you can see whether you've got line or sight or not. But now, this is, this is not the four-thirds Earth uh, ray tracing. This is not an RF trace. This is a line of sight trace. So even if this thing went right through the top 500 feet of that mountain is probably going to work. But at least this tells you what will absolutely work. And then um, uh, John Higgins KX40 found this online, no, this uh, uh, free software. So then he went back and took all of the uh, links and entered them into this. And so for all 14 links, we have this. And look at this one. This one actually works with 12 dB margin. And it plots the statistics, you know, that says you'll, you'll have that 12 dB margin, uh, you know, sigma, you know, uh, two-thirds of the time. And then it, it shows you what the 97% the, uh, the time is and everything else. So we were just having a great time, and we never left our shacks. <laughs> In fact, all the fun was setting it up. So th this is where we got distracted with APRS. Is also, to me, uh, the APRS map was nothing about a map. It was about the network, seeing the network, seeing how high people were, seeing what could connect to what, see how, who I could link through to get to wherever. And th that all... Uh, got washed out when people started saying, well, look at these neat maps we can do. Well, to me, where is the APRS on it? And there's 11 stations on there, but you can't even see them. Okay, to me, the clutter of the map has completely gotten rid of the amateur radio aspect here. Um, uh, and, of course, uh, it's packet reporting system, and we all know how that works. And we all know that uh, once you're... Uh, Everything is local on RF, but everything that's local on RF is being picked up by somebody and fed into the Internet cloud where it's available to anybody that's logged on, all the uh, shack jockeys. And then, um, uh, but if you send a message, you're just, your message just goes out in all directions everywhere. Once it gets into the Internet, it goes everywhere. But it doesn't go back to the 1200 baud channel. We couldn't possibly afford that. It only goes back to the 1200 baud channel if there's a gateway that has heard the person that you're... Uh, uh, that, call, that matches your, the call sign you sent it to, and then that gateway just automatically sends it out to local RF. So we have global HT to HT connectivity, um, and, and all you need is the call sign. Now, and we're talking about live messaging, not mail store and forward or anything else. Uh, so this is what an APRS uh, map was back in 1990 when we first invented it, and it's still what I like to look at, because I'm not interested, you know, if I want to do maps, I'll go to Google Earth. Uh, but, uh, you know, every station shows up on the map plus his, uh, his uh, communications range based on his power, height, and gain. And so you can see very click, uh, clearly if you send out a packet, where it's going to go, who's going to bounce off of, and, and so forth. Um, uh, another frustrating thing to me is every clone of APRS since the original just uses 
the simplicity of Windows icons. They're missing eight dimensions of information that it was supposed to be in APRS, and that is being able to tell um, what is a dead reckoned position. This, this packet is, uh, is one minute old because that's where my position was. That's where I have dead reckoned to. This is an object from somebody else. This is a weather station. This is a, uh, an object by somebody else that's moving. Uh, this is a station that has alarmed or high priority set on it. Here's another one that's been dead reckoned. Uh, this one is a tracker. It doesn't quite show up here. This one is gray instead of white. White means it has two-way messaging capability. Gray means it's a tracker and is, uh, you can't talk to it. It's just something on the map. All of that color, eight attributes of color, is lost in most uh, implementations of APRS that everybody else sees. And so that's why people can look at an APRS uh, map display these days and really not get any information out of it. It's just like you know, pretty things on a map, but you can't tell what's new, what's old, who you, who you can talk to, what's been dead reckoned, what's an object, do, what are your objects, what are their objects. And the answer those authors always give me, oh, you can click on it. When I got 350 things on the screen, I can't go around clicking just to see what I'm supposed to see from the original design of the system. So as you can tell, I'm, I'm very frustrated. OK. Um, so uh, again, the original icons were supposed to show direction uh, and, and again, all the different attributes of color as to uh, whose object and who owned it and so forth. Um, and of course, then it's all tied into the internet and you go to findyou.com, click on a call sign and you, know, you can zoom all the way in and, and see which side of his driveway he's parked in. And, uh, but, but here, uh, and of course, on findyou.com, it sorts them by distance and um, you can click on nearby activity and then see the complete map of everybody around him. But here's the column that, that I'm talking about today, and that is uh, you also, anybody who's sending messages, there's a, a message display. You click on that, and what you see is, well, okay, that's the nearby activity. So for 40 miles uh, screen, and this is, uh, whoops, too many buttons up here. This is Annapolis, Washington, D.C. Beltway, Baltimore Beltway. So you see in this area, got about um, 100, uh, 150 users. If I go out 90 miles, I've got 350 users uh, to play with, all of whom I can talk to on two meters, you know, uh, uh, via one repeater. And so those 350 people are also people that I should be able to text message uh, just to find out what frequency they're on or something, because we've got 100 repeaters in the area. Of course, only three are ever in use, you know, these days at any one time, but... Um, so that's what I view APRS as, as, as the single universal uh, contact channel uh, to, see, uh, to establish communications, uh, to find out where somebody is to be able to establish communications. So this is what you get when you look at the text screen. And so you can go online and you can see what uh, people are saying to each other. But, and you see it, it is just text messaging because we're all doing it with our thumbs uh, you know, on, on a touchstone uh, keypad. Um, and then we get into weather and... Uh, we all know what APRS is about. If, uh, 40,000 users now is what we're talking about. But in any one ham club, that's only 2% of the ham club. And so that's another frustration, is we can do all the fancy stuff we want to with APRS. We can text message and everything else. But if we're just a sideshow, if we're only able to talk to the other 2%, then we really can't bring anything to an event except vehicle tracking. And so that's why it's all anybody ever sees of uh, vehicle tracking. Well, that's why the universal amateur radio messaging initiative is to say, let's take all of our text capability, tie them all in together, so now the other 98% of ham radio, all of us can talk with whatever device we have, or here's the way I say it, you can text message any other ham, anytime, anywhere, using any device, all you need is this call sign. That's what we should be doing. We, we've been able to do that for 10 years now. Uh, we just need uh, everybody to think on, on that same page and instead of having Echo Link, chat mode can only talk to Echo Link users, WinLink can only talk to WinLink, um, you know, Blackberries, and you can go on from there. Anyway, um, so I'm going to zoom through. These are some of my generic slides. I don't know why some of these aren't uh, showing up. I'll skip the ones that don't. So here's where we are, the current state of the art. Um, and that was in, um, I guess, two years ago, three years ago, how long ago, uh, uh, Kenwood came out with the D710. Um, uh, and it's, it's their current model, and they added eight additional bytes on the display. And the most important reason for that is, is that every station now, in addition to transmitting your latitude and your longitude and your height above average terrain, uh, so that we can see you in 3D as far as your uh, RF range, now we know what frequency you're on. 
That's the one thing we left out of APRS from the get-go was the realization that APRS is just a single channel for sharing information, but you're always doing something else on amateur radio. And we want that frequency information of that other thing that you're doing to be shown in your APRS packet so people know how to get in contact with you or, or what, you're, what you're doing. So now, not only does the, the Kenwood dis, uh, radio dis, display that information uh, in this column over here, they also add, uh, uh, the D710 then also transmits what position, uh, um, frequency you're on because it's a dual band radio. So every time your position report goes out, the frequency that your other band on your radio is tuned to also goes out. So now everybody can see where you are and can call you immediately. In fact, it's only one push button away because they also added the tune button. So when you see somebody on the list, you move your cursor there, hit tune, and then hit push to talk, and you're talking to the guy. Okay, so that was really the objective. Uh, now, once we're displaying frequency and we're one button away from any frequency that shows up on the front panel of the radio, then uh, about in 2004, we said, I want every repeater in the country, you know, we've got the repeater directory, uh, 10,000 listings, you know, you drive through Chicago, and you've got five pages worth of repeaters to choose from while you're driving. No, okay. Uh, the, the purpose of the putting frequency object on APRS is not to list all 50 repeaters that you can hit from Elk Grove, but to list the one repeater that is recommended for a mobile or a traveler in Elk Grove to, to be able to talk to somebody, you know, an active channel or somebody's monitoring or something else like that. So that's what we've been uh, trying to say now. So you, you see these thousands of digipeters, that's what ties the APRS network together. These digipeters are at all these high locations and in the past, all the DigiPeter did was identify itself. Okay, now, as it's, uh, it's the fundamental setup of those. We want those things to do two things, and that is to send out a packet that identifies itself, but also send out a packet once every 10 minutes, direct, simplex, only within the footprint of that DigiPeter that's telling those people, it puts a frequency object on their map. It shows what frequency they should be using when they're in that footprint to communicate with other hands. So now I can drive all the way across country. I don't have to go through the 10,000 listings in the repeater directory. Just whatever frequency pops up on the front panel of my display, I know that I'm within simplex range, which means the input range of that voice frequency, and I just push the tune button on my Kenwood radio, and instantly I'm in a new neighborhood, and I instantly have somebody to talk to. So we've been doing that since 2004, and um, it's slowly catching on. I could go through some entire states and never see a single repeater show up on the radio. Uh, some areas you can go through and just, you know, every 10 miles you're within range of a new voice repeater and it shows up right there on the radio. Hit tune button, say APRS mobile, and you usually got somebody to talk to. And they probably want to talk about APRS, so it's great. <laughs> um, well, let's see, let's back up one. Did I mention, of course, uh, and now... Um, uh, Yezu has joined the, the fun with the VX8R, a uh, fantastic uh, radio for the hiker because it has the, the uh, GPS fully integrated into the uh, speaker mic. And so if you're a hiker, you just put that on and away you go and, and, and mom can track you back home. It also texts messages, sends and receives messages and so forth. And in fact, uh, you can get rid of the speaker mic and they have an, a mechanical attachment that will attach the GPS right there. It, it, it kind of looks like a, a matchbox uh, flat and sideways on the top of the radio. It's kind of ungainly looking, but at least it's what we've always wanted, and that is a single piece of thing you hold in your hand and, you know, you're, as you, you talk, your uh, position is also shown. Um, and, of course, what most people don't realize, and uh, Kenwood does a lousy uh, job of advertising, um, the, you can use the, the control head off the D710. Uh, you can plug it into any radio, just, you know, DIN connector to DIN connector, tune that radio to 144.39, and now you've got an APRS radio because all of the functionality of the Kenwood D710 that I've described uh, is built into the control head. It's not in the radio, it's in the control head. So the control head then will plug into any radio. It will not control the radio because, you know, they're apples and oranges, but all, uh, it, uh, the TNC, everything is in the control head. So here we've, we've put it on a D-Star radio so that uh, we can bring them out of the dark ages as well. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, here's the, the, the control head of the D710 attached to an Alinko, an $88 Alinko uh, HT. And of course, what's sandwiched between the control head and the HT is uh, a set of NICADs to provide the 350 milliamps that the display head requires. 
The beauty of that is, though, that you know, if you live in a place where you can't leave the control head on the, uh, in your car anyway because you're concerned about theft or anything, you just pop off the control head, stick it in your pocket, and you walk into work, you pull your HT out of the drawer, plug it into your D7 control head, and now there, you know, at your desk, you're completely uh, live APRS communications and, and can continue your, the fun. Um, com misconceptions, this is a web page, and every one of those is a link as to you know, what people don't understand about APRS. And, and number one is you don't need a GPS unless you're lost uh, uh, or, can't read, or can't read a map. You know? so, um, but I'll just keep moving on. Now, here's, here's where, uh, where APRS, uh, there's growth opportunities, and that's why I'm presenting to this group is because uh, remember, I wrote APRS in Quick Basic, okay? So I've been left behind years ago. I'm dependent on new programmers who can do this Windows junk and, and everything else and, and can really, uh, you know, keep the, keep the uh, program alive. And so, uh, we, so we've had uh, global email uh, for, you know, almost 10 years now. And that is, again, all you do is you send a message to email instead of to a call sign. And then the, the call sign or email address is the first word of the message. And it, it goes instantly uh, uh, into the email system. So we have that. That's done. Now we're talking about un the universal text messaging system, which is just an expansion of that idea. Uh, the other thing we didn't have for the first 15 years or so was you go to uh, APRS Field Day, and the only, other th the only thing you can talk to is the other APRS sites that are within simplex range of you or you know, within your local area. But there's a whole world of people out there playing Field Day that same day, and you can send them a message. Uh, you don't need to know anything. Just all you need to know is their call sign. But we didn't have any way of seeing what the call sign of a field day activity was in Germany, for example, because you, you can't send in the blind unless you know the call sign. So uh, 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 we now have what's called a CQ server. So now you send your message to CQ server saying CQ field day, and that puts you on the CQ field day list. And now anything anybody else that sends in a message to CQ server that says CQ field day gets bombed back out to everybody. So it's, it's kind of like a global um, um, uh, message group uh, capability. And now you're limited only one message every 30 minutes because since you can send a message that bombs you know, the whole world, uh, we have to have some uh, limit on that. But we use that for the Appalachian Trail, for example. Um, uh, as soon as I left my house, I had you know, 200 miles or 100 miles to go to get to the top of my mountaintop. But as soon as I left my driveway, I sent a message that says CQ, um, to CQ uh, AT for the Appalachian Trail. And uh, I got the, the, the CQ AT response back that says you're logged in. And from that point on, uh, oh, and my message says I'm underway. And from that point on, then, I began to receive messages from all the other people all over the country that were headed to their mountaintops. So we were using APRS, the established network, to, you know, text message uh, as we're en route to our, our event. Uh, okay, working our way down. APR has touched on and been talking about it since 2001. And again, uh, that is the, the concept of when I send a message on my uh, APRS HT, I'm using the touchtone keypad. The only difference between that and any other radio is that it's being converted to APRS in that radio. There's no reason why I can't push the same buttons on the touchtone keypad and have a remote computer somewhere listening to that simplex channel and doing the DTMF to APRS conversion at that location. And so it's a piece of cake. Uh, anybody in the world then could text message, could report their position, and, and anything else. And, I, and I'll explain. Um, you got to think outside the box to see how that works. Um, automatic voice uh, relay system. This was also, we've been pushing since 2000. We've got Echolink being able to do worldwide uh, communications, you know, mobile to mobile, HT to HT. All you need to know is the guy's call sign uh, or his node number. We've got APRS that can find anybody in the, on the planet with nothing but his call sign, and you can send a six-digit you can send a 67-character message. But if you simply send uh, "call me on one two three four five six, you can send that out, and this guy, no matter where he is on the world, he'll receive that message, and you know he'll look up his local echo link, he'll dial you up, and you can talk. So the idea was, let's use APRS signaling, global signaling, as the way to, again, establish end-to-end um, -end connectivity, um, uh, including voice. And of course, now, um, I was surprised to learn that Echolink, again, has a chat mode now. So everybody who's talking on Echo, uh, Echolink, they has, have a little chat window in front of them. And he's got, what, hundreds of thousands of users. And they're all sitting there talking to each other on, uh, uh, you know, Echo Link, Link's voice. 
and they have a chat window, and yet I'm driving around in my mobile. I'm hearing this Echolink uh, network. You know, it's a conference uh, node like the local AMSAT thing uh, are talking. I can hear these guys talking, and I'm, but I can't get a word in edgewise because, you know, the delays. But if they would just let me send an APRS text message that says, check me in, um, then they would turn around and call me. And it would show up in their, their text messaging window. But do you know why? So I've contacted the Echolink author. And do you know why he says he's, he's kind of hesitant to do that? Because who is the benefiter of, that, of displaying that, that message on the chat window of Echolink? The shack potato. The guy who's not using Echolink for anything other than, geez, I can sit in my shack and I can talk to anybody in the world, and I don't even have to hook up an antenna or anything. Okay, and so he's kind of like where I am. He doesn't want to add any features that's a benefit to the shack potato. He wants these guys to get out and use amateur radio, and Echolink only happens to be a way of tunneling RF to RF. Instead, just like a lot of people on APRS, they just sit in front of their internet-connected computer, <clears throat> and they think, oh, this is what Echolink is, this is what APRS is. So uh, I'm still trying to put the pressure on him to say, no, let me as a mobile send a message into that chat window uh, uh, that that is open to everybody who's involved in that Echolink conference. Very bottom one, APRS uh, ID, uh, RFID. You heard of how they use RFID at the Minco Marathon. So anyhow, we've been able to do global APRS email uh, you know, for 10 years, and that is you just, instead of sending it to a call sign, you send it to the word email. The first part of the message is the uh, email address, and uh, you, you don't have a lot more room on a 67-character line, but... Um, uh, the message will be delivered. And people say, well, that's so limiting. Well, they used to say, I'm never going to send a message, you know, with a touchstone keypad. That is, that is so whatever. But ask any kid in America. You know, that, they, that's their first language, and they speak English or Spanish or whatever is their second language. Um, so anyway, uh, we've had that, done that. So we can send a message to anybody um, and now, just in the last two or three years, we've been hesitant to do the reverse, and that is anybody in the world can send an, uh, an email to your mobile radio because spam and, and all that other uh, potential for errors. But the, the three major uh, APRS um, websites now allow you to do that. You see somebody on the map, and even if you're a shack jockey, you can send the guy a message uh, just with a browser from anywhere, and uh, it'll pop right up on the front panel of his uh, mobile radio. But again, going in that direction, it's live. You know, it's going to go right to his radio. If he's in the 7-Eleven getting a cup of coffee, uh, he's not going to see it flash there. He's going to come back in, and he'll see the little window that says you've got a message. You don't have to go ask for it. But um, if his radio is turned off, then he's, he's not going to get that message. Now, um, but again, APRS was always supposed to be just live. So that's a new initiative now is to turn that around. Well, so this is how, how it looks on the radio. Uh, you, you, you go to uh, input. Um, well, you, you can list previous traffic. Uh, you can input the message, and you just type it in. Here I was doing a satellite demo from Ocean City with, a, with nothing but a whip. And when you transmit the message, and even if you transmit via satellite, if, if your radio hears it digipeated, then it knows you know, everybody within 2,000 miles of that satellite also heard that. And so it, it flashes this message here that says, uh, my message, showing that it was relayed. Uh, here's the global CQ system that I talked about. You can send a message to CQ Scouts, CQ Joda, CQ Saturn, you know, that's the uh, Salvation Army, uh, CQ Iota, CQ School Club Roundup, CQ Field Day, CQ Apples, you know. And anybody else who sends a message anywhere in the world to CQ Apples, you'll all receive each other's message from that point on. Again, a global ability to set up message groups. Um, APR's touch tone, I've hinted on that again. And you say, well, I'm not going to sit there and type in a bunch of numbers on my HT. You don't have to. You type it in once. That is my call sign, WB4APR, with a pound on the end. I store that in memory location number zero or number one. And now, anytime I am anywhere, I go to 146.58. We picked that out of the blue. Could be, uh, you know, the wars have not begun yet. And if somebody's got a uh, an APRS touch tone um, uh, PC running that hears that touch tone sequence, it says, aha, I just heard WB4APR, and I'm in Elk Grove. That's where this touch tone decoder heard me. So it, it, puts a, uh, it, 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 it makes a packet, 
that contains uh, my call sign, the position of Elk Grove, and I'll explain that in a minute, uh, the date and the time, and uh, it puts on some local text like at the DCC conference, and uh, that's 95% of what APRS is. Uh, who are you, where are you, when, what time, how recently have I heard from you, and how can I get in contact with you? Oh, the, the, the local uh, node here could also, you know, put the echo link frequency in that packet as well. So now a person knows how to, from anywhere in the world, how to contact you by voice or packet. And, uh, or the person could send you a message. You say, well, how am I going to receive a message on a DTMF HT? You're, you're thinking inside a box. You've got to think outside that box. You use voice synthesis. So this PC that's sitting over here listening for the DTMF on the input, when it gets a message off the APRS network, um, it will uh, wait until it sees my call sign. Again, no position information. It's just a pre-recorded, stored, one-time only DTMF string. As soon as it sees that, it'll say uh, WB4 APR three messages. And I push the number th three, and it'll play me back the third. It's just like your answering machine. And it'll speak the messages to me. So, you know, it's, it's universal text messaging uh, with voice synthesis. So you don't even, well, while you're driving, you know, you just push one button and you can hear your me incoming messages. Um, so here's how you show up on the map. So if I was heard on the 147.105 repeater with my touch tone pre-recorded call sign, it puts me on the map and it just bumps up the latitude by a fixed amount so that anybody looking at this map on any client, any web page, anything in the world will see all of the touchtone users on that repeater showing up as a list by that repeater. So again, it puts the person on the map. The person's uh, symbol is a little DTMF keypad, which everybody will know is uh, the guy is a, a touchtone user. And so, uh, you know, I don't expect anything more from him, but at least I know where he is uh, in the world, what frequency he's on. And, uh, and, and what he's doing, because if you click on him, then you, you'll get the packet that contains the fi additional fixed information that was added onto it by the 147.105 repeater or the node that might be running on somebody's laptop here in the room. Um, oh, also, you'll notice that uh, the, a the format for frequency also includes a, a, a field for the tone, the offset, and, and everything else. So the Kimwood radio does all of that. It doesn't do it on UHF, but it does it on VHF. It will tune, but it will not do the shift because for some reason Kenwood uh, has a lot, some, several of the manufacturers still do not recognize a standard offset on UHF. So, uh, you know, it assumes a standard offset, and if the radio doesn't recognize a standard offset, then it's just going to put you on simplex, and you've got to push the shift button to, to be able to get into a repeater if somebody's on UHF. So, uh, for special events, uh, the APRS touch tune, uh, you know, again, you just have it running on a laptop with one radio listening for, on the simplex frequency for the DTMF users and then the other, uh, uh, probably an HT or something, going out to the APRS. So all the APRS users can all see each other, and now the DTMF users can identify themselves where they are and so forth. All the APRS people can see them. When the APRS guys send a message to anybody, the DTMF users can, uh, can receive it. Um, so uh, I've been talking about this since 2001. I actually wrote it. It was working beautifully under DOS. I did not write it because I expect anybody to use it that way, but to show people what it could do. But it required an external touch tone decoder and uh, an external uh, D to A to do the voice synthesis. And, uh, but it's taken me until this date and to finally convince somebody else to write the Windows software because, remember, this will be an entirely software application, no hardware, because you can do DTMF decoding on the sound card and you can do the speech uh, synthesis going back. Now, unfortunately, this guy uh, got real hot to, uh, hot to trot and, and put it all together, and he was in this booth uh, at Dayton, and so anybody at Dayton could report their position anywhere in this 9900-unit grid just by two digits. Uh, so this, to be in this grid right here, you just enter 44. So you send your pre-recorded call sign and then 44 star, and now you're on the map. Everybody in the world can see that you're in the center part of the eating area at Dayton. And it worked. And if, if somebody did not enter their position, uh, anybody who's been to Dayton knows that this is a, 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 about a quarter acre lot of uh, trees. That's, that's the only thing that's not, that's green at Dayton, and the only thing that's not a parking lot. And so if anybody sent in just their call sign, then they were added, the list was built over in, in the trees. 
Um, because again, part of the setup of an APRSTT node is to say, where do you want this list on the map to begin to grow as people check in? And that's a local setup option. So any call signs you saw over here in the trees with their little touchstone symbol were people who had, re who had been heard at Dayton but had not gone to the trouble of entering two digits to show where they were. You could also enter four digits, and you can uh, locate yourself to the nearest uh, 60 feet. Okay, and so uh, W4PC, uh, uh, who writes a, a software called Radio Spotter, he took this on. He, he made the software. It worked. I thought we were going to finally have APRSTT, and unfortunately, about the time of Dayton, he had some other crises that had come up, and so he has not been able to get back to it. So I'm still proselytizing. I'm still trying to find somebody that's going to write that software to just take, a, just take DTMF, convert it to text, and take text and convert it to speech. And then the other 98% of people in your ham radio club or at your event can be involved in the tactical situation that's digitally recorded. Um, oh, okay, there's the live shot of Dayton, and you can see uh, something's wrong with your PC back there. Um, so the green, the, the blue things are the, uh, are the uh, touchstone uh, users, and these are the guys that are show up in the trees because they didn't enter a position. And there's one guy here, there's one just off the map, and there's one down here who actually entered uh, his position. Everybody else is the typical 150 uh, people that are uh, in and around Dayton during a Dayton weekend. Um, and I'm saying this can be built into something as small as a PIC processor and a, and a little tiny track. Because again, it doesn't have to receive packet, it just has to receive DTMF and send the packet. And that's what every one of these little 30 or 40, 50 dollar trackers can do. So, uh, you know, uh, or the open tracker, anybody could, uh, could start making these devices. Um, and here's how we use it at, 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 at Boy Scout event. Um, uh, here were uh, troops, hundreds of them, have to go to these 20 checkpoints. And so we have 20 amateur radio op operators standing out there in January holding an HT. And their job is, is every time the whistle blows from each one of these 20 locations, they report the score and um, a troop number and a score from any one, every one of 20 uh, places. And it takes uh, tens of minutes for all those people to get all that information checked in. And you can imagine all the transcription errors and everything else. So I've always said, and for the last couple of years, uh, I just take my kid with D7HT. Well, the slides are out of order. Let me go ahead and say, so here's where we, we go and say, but we have, there's 300,000 of these radios out there. It's the um, FT51R series and the TH78 series radios that you can text message. It's just a small six character text window, but you can put a troop number and a score in that, in that window. So why are we doing this stuff by voice and having to wait for your turn to check in, wait for net control to uh, respond to you and everything else, when you could just enter your data and be done? Um, oh, this is the main one I wanted to show. And it, what it does is it shows how all I did was take a, a Kenwood D700, put the control head on, the, on a clipboard. And then out in the field, I've got my D7. And so I can key in a troop number and a score. What shows up on the control head is a... Uh, station number, the station that I'm at, and then all he has to do is at his convenience, and remember net control is the busiest guy, at his convenience he just click, there's the troop number and the score. And the, uh, our uh, net control is a guy who's been doing this thing, same job for the last 50 years, and uh, you know he would never do APR. So I said, well let me just put this clipboard in front of you, and you know uh, my scores are going to come in that way. After the event, he said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, because you can imagine how he's being pulled 20 different ways by all these people trying to check in and give him voice, but whenever he's got a spare moment, he can just go right down my score, because it's right there. Even better than that, doesn't require a ham operator. He can hit, hand that clipboard to a Cub Scout and say, as these numbers come in, write them down. Done. Okay. We've been able to do that for now 12 years, and I... People just don't think outside the box. They don't do text messaging. There's what the net control sees. He sees the station number when the report come in, uh, and then he clicks on it. All right, here's my outgoing message. My outgoing message is going to net control, and this is troop number 874, and their score is 42. And so when he clicks on station number three or whatever, there's the score. That's all he needs. No computers, no networks, no nothing, just text messaging. Okay. Uh, and here's that same idea. Download you can do this now today, you can do this for the last uh, five years or so. Uh, download any kind of DTMF display, 
uh, and tell and train your people how to send how to use their touch tone to send five numbers, and you can do this, you can do this Boy Scout uh, event reporting. Um, and, and there there are so many radios. Uh, even the FM uh, FTM 10R now has a new. Uh, they're starting to use DCS, you know, digital coded coded squelch texting. Everything is building in text messaging, and I'm appealing to you guys who know how to write software to pick any text messaging capability that you want and just tie it into the global APRS network. And now any message that you see to any call sign, just blindly throw it into the APRS network because if the guy's out there driving around in his mobile, he'll get the message. Okay. I even did it I, with a little pick processor. You just add two capacitors and uh, 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 two resistors, a uh, low-pass filter, and this chip generates D, uh, DTMF. So this one actually is a different application. It takes all, uh, all the APRS uh, traffic on the 144.39 channel, and it looks only for locals. And whenever it sees a, a local, it converts that to DTMF, and it sends it to one of those DTMF paging radios. And so now the, the, the call sign and the distance from you and the direction shows up on that radio. Um, yeah, so this is showing how uh, I'm using the TNC here to decode the little PIC processor to convert it to touch tones, transmit it, and now these uh, 300,000 radios that are out there can display the nearby APRS activity on that one-line display. Uh, now, here's the RFID thing, and that is uh, I would like to have an ARL or AMSAT uh, name badge that has a little RFID chip in it, and every time, I walk through, every time I walk through the door at the clubhouse where there's a little RFID reader, that RFID gets converted to an APRS message and gets transmitted. That's all it is, just a little black box that you, you can set by the door at the clubhouse or at the EOC or any place that hams gather, and every person that walks in that has his name badge on uh, will, to the world show up on APRS. You'll see where he is, when he got there, when he leaves, everything, and you can text message and you know where he is. Um, I'm going to tell you what voice alert is because it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. How many uh, know what it is? Okay. APRS voice alert. We're, we're driving around the entire um, North American continent. If you turn into 144.39, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear wall-to-wall -wall packets. That's the APRS uh, network on the North American continent. But there's another bit of information in there and that is, out of those 999 packets that you're hearing, there may be one once every five or 10 minutes that has a PL tone on it. And that PL tone tells you that that packet you heard direct, not via repeater, but there's another ham radio operator who's also listening to 144.39. I mean, they're all listening to 144.39, but what are they doing? They got the volume turned down because they don't want to hear that packet racket. What a waste of a national calling channel is to have the volume turned down, especially when everybody knows that you're on that frequency. Why in the world you got the volume turned down? What you do instead of turning the volume down is you set CTCSS 100. Now the speaker is completely quiet. The channel is wall-to-wall -wall packets, but the speaker is completely quiet. But anybody who sees you within three or four miles could just key up on 144.39 with a PL 100 and say, hey, Joe, meet me on 5.2. Bingo. No matter what his other side of the radio was doing, he could be on HF, he could be on some other two meter frequency or UHF, it doesn't matter. We know he's listening on 144.39 with CTCSS 100. So next time you're driving on the long interstates, you never hear anything on 5.2, switch over to 144.39 with CTCSS 100, you'll still hear dead quiet just like 5.2, but if another APRS operator who's running voice alert passes anywhere within you know, five miles of you, you're gonna hear a packet once a minute as he drives by, and at 140 miles an hour, you're only going to hear two or three packets. That's about all the alert you get. And, um, and so it's like a radar detector as well. Uh, it, it alerts you that somebody else is in range, and he's got his speaker on, and he's listening. So that's what voice alert is. And uh, so here's a better display kind of showing you how a, a frequency object will show up. This is a cross-band repeater, and so the, the object name is the... Uh, the output of the repeater and the input frequency is listed down in the text along with the tone and the range and so forth. And this is how the station list shows up. Now, this station, notice that uh, you can now sort everything on the list. Uh, this radio now has 100 uh, uh, depth to its list display. That's a lot of stations to look for. But fortunately, you can sort them alphabetically or by distance or by time. Here, I've sorted by call sign 
alphabetically. So what pops to the top of the list? All the numeric frequency objects. So now this shows me that I'm within range of these three uh, uh, voice repeaters, and all I got to do is select it, push tune, and now I can talk on those. Uh, and this is what one of them looks like on the D7, uh, uh, the, the D7HT. Again, it show, well, it's the same one. It's showing you the split frequencies and what tone. Um, that's kind of the density of APRS, but that was back in 2004. But you can see in most areas, it, it, some areas it's totally saturated, and everywhere else uh, there's plenty of room, but there's somebody everywhere. And I, I drive around in the middle of Utah, actually, uh, uh, southwest Utah, where there's, nobody lives. Uh, you know, I was out on the interstate, and all of a sudden, for about two minutes, I heard these packets, and, I, you know, there was a trucker going the opposite direction because I was listening on voice alert. Um, this is just a bunch of stuff that uh, the original APRS DOS does that, you know, again, nobody copied because I don't know, they think of APRS as only a vehicle tracking system. Uh, fantastic for ray tracing, you know, network an analysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, direction finding by signal strength alone. Um, I won't bore you with that. Let's get down. This is, uh, this is doing direction finding. And uh, again, people launch balloons with GPS payloads, but I don't even leave my shack for that. What I really get excited about is when they launch a balloon and the GPS fails. Now it's fun. Now it's ham radio. And so, but with nothing but a, a, a mobile and an HT, everybody in this room should be able to find any transmitter. If you just think like a ham radio operator, think about the VHF propagation. You know, you all know you can hold your HT here and you can get a, a beam heading, you know, off your back where the null is, but that's direction finding. I'm talking about signal strength alone, and that is you just, uh, and you can see me doing it here. You, you walk, um, uh, well, this was corn, and it's not in the winter. I actually did this in the summer, so there's 10-foot high corn, and it didn't take me very long to realize you only go one way in a corn patch. <laughs> and that is uh, down this way. I could tell it was over this way somewhere, but I, I just gave up. I went out to found a road, came back. You just walk along here, and you can hear the noise, you know, signal-to-noise ratio. You can hear that the, the, the signal was the strongest right about in here. Now, these dots are all things that I just added by hand afterwards to, to give you a sense of what I was hearing by ear. And so I walked back and forth here, and I said, okay, song, song, longest, uh, strongest signal is right here, and I don't want to go into the woods. I'm going to go this way. Unfortunately, I was the right direction. So I go in a little ways. I go back and forth, find the center, go in a little ways, back and forth, find the center. Now, the white is where I've actually taken the antenna off of my HT, and now uh, I can there's enough signal to just for the HT without an antenna. And again, I just keep going back, whoops, uh, walking back and forth, uh, finding the signal, and then go perpendicular, back and forth. I didn't see it until I was three feet from it. So I got within three feet of that HT, uh, or that balloon payload. This was just one of those little keychain transmitters that they launched in a little Coke bottle on a party balloon, okay? They, when they launched it, that was it. They, they weren't even going to go after it. I said, what do you mean? You're, gonna go, you're not going to go chase that? That's the whole fun of it, you know? And they said, no, the kids, you know, they, they got to see it, and they got to use their beams, and they know, know it went north. And no, we just write these things off. And I said, well, I'm going home that way. I'm going to find it. It didn't take me but, you know, a half hour to find it. Um, so anyway, this is another. Now this one was supposed to be an APRS balloon, so we knew the exact coordinates. Well, we did until when the when the balloon burst at 100,000 feet, uh, and then the the balloon blew up, the parachute failed, and this thing's coming down like a missile at uh, you know 1,000 feet per minute or, or more. And so uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, idea to know where it was. But again, drove back and forth on the roads till I found kind of where the signal was the strongest. Got out of my car, and, and this was a complete balloon payload that you know. A balloon this big, 15 feet of cord, a parachute, a radio sonde on the bottom, a box this big, and everything else. And I figured, this is not corn, this is soybeans. It's one foot high. I should be able to see that. And I couldn't see it from the road anywhere. Again, I didn't see the little blue dot. I did not see that balloon payload until I was within 15 feet of it. Oh, I did want to point out, uh, you'll see on display out there, I do have uh, the latest Naval Academy satellite, but the point that I'm making here is that all of APRS, you know, the TNC, the radio, the transmitter, the receiver, the AX25, the telemetry and everything else now is down to a three-inch by three-inch circuit card, 
which is one of, just one of the APRS trackers that you can buy you know, for tracking your vehicle. But all we've got to do is put that in a satellite, and now we've got a, a, an APRS transponder. And uh, these, this three-inch circuit card can also make a digipeter, a remote telemetry device, a text messaging system, anything else. But it's all on a, on a three-inch uh, circuit card. So that's why I brought this, uh, this thing. Um, and like I said, if anybody wants to tell me what they know about home um, solar energy, I, I am a, uh, a born-again convert uh, as of one week. Because one week ago, I completely ignored it. Now, all of a sudden, I realize uh, it's time to jump into that. So. Uh, any questions about APRs and text messaging? Uh, Bob, uh, I have to comment on your cornfield uh, recovery effort. Uh, we landed an ATV uh, balloon in a cornfield, and we searched it for a couple hours. We knew from DF headings about where it was, but we could not find it. And I had a little portable TV set with me watching the image from the camera from the balloon payload showing the, the roots of the corn stalk. And finally, I saw a big tennis shoe come into the field of view, and I said to the guy, I put out an announcement, I shouted out, stop, whoever you are, right where you are. And they could not see it. They were one foot away, one row away, and they could yeah. not see the payload, but I could see him on ATV. So we need to hone our direction finding capabilities and don't get so lazy by thinking that GPS is, good, is, is God's answer to everything. People drive off bridges now because they believe that, you know, turn left, okay. <laughs> When you hook up uh, front panels to uh, other radios, like the D700 or whatever, do, were you using homemade cables, or are there just stock off-the-shelf adapters? Uh, for the last 10, 15 years, all of the Japanese radios come with a DIN connector that you know, connects direct to the discriminator, the modulator, and the audio, and the mic. And so um, that's a standard connection uh, from every radio, and that's the same connection that's on the back of the control head. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an off-the-shelf cable to almost all radios. Or you have to hack your own cable if you've got some other access to discriminator or audio. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, how did the Appalachian uh, Trail event uh, go? Uh, did you were able to contact from one end to the other? Oh, it was a hoot. I, you know, I've never had so much fun. But again, that's all. What it's all about is is fun. The problem is, is of course, you've got a chain. All 14 stations have to work, and it's the first time we'd ever done that. And some of the people, it was the first time they'd ever gone up the top of the mountain. Well, there was, uh, there was one guy in central Virginia that couldn't find the top of a mountain. Um, <clears throat> and it was raining, and so he didn't want to go out on, his, uh, on foot and, and check it out. So uh, we had a break in the chain in, in central Virginia. Um, we couldn't get anybody in Maine to um, go up to Mount Katahdin. Um, and we had one other, there was a guy, the volunteer in uh, New Jersey was handicapped, not New Jersey, in New York was handicapped, and he assumed that somebody was going to give him a ride up there and he couldn't get a ride. So we had two breaks in the chain, but each of the groups uh, had a lot of fun. And the other thing that we learned, remember, I, I think I said that we were also, uh, we did the CQ server so that we could all be text messaging as we're mobiling, you know, during the several hours of setup. It was only a four-hour event. You know, we didn't want to take, every, like field day, you know, it takes a whole weekend. We wanted to just take four hours. And um, so we could all text message, but we'd also said, let's use this as a challenge to see if we could all echo link into a conference node and, and do voice coordination uh, just to show that we can do it. Well, that's when we found out that none of us knew how to do echo link. You know, I've been, I've, been, I've been talking about echo link for years and years and years, but I don't use it because it's firewalled at work and, you know, I'm a couch potato at work and that, that's my total access to uh, ham radio now is from, from the internet, right? And, and um, but... All the other volunteers that got up there and said, well, you know, I've never really used Echo Link. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we've got a lot to learn, and that, that's the purpose of this exercise. But every, every single team, even the ones that got rained on and dropped their radio and hooked it up backwards and everything else, they, they said they're going to be up there uh, with spades uh, uh, next, next year. Okay, I think that's about all we have time for. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> <laughs>